we talked about the Word of God the last message. And this message is what the Word of God does. And I left out one thing a while ago. People gripe and grumble and and they're lazy. You know that people are lazy. People are lazy by nature. We are. We're lazy. Except for me. <laughs> and I take on too much all the time. And I think that's my my stepfather, Dale, used to tell me that I was nothing but a lazy Indian. Because I could figure out how to do something faster than anybody else. I could get it done quicker than anybody else. They said, that's because you're so lazy. <laughs> well, maybe. Erasmus was uh, 30 years old, probably a little bit older, when he, he had a great inspiration. He was a Catholic priest. He was a Catholic priest until he died. Now, Erasmus was a, a very honest biblical scholar, the greatest Latin scholar that ever lived. I told you in the last message that, uh, that he told the Catholic Church that if he'd, they'd like for him to make a translation of the whole Bible, that he could do a better job than Jerome did. Jerome was not near the scholar that Erasmus was. He had a great mind, a tremendous mind in languages. He knew about seven or eight languages. And they said no. He was so inspired by the Greek text. He said, this is the living word of God that I'm touching. I've, I've got it right here. He didn't have the manuscripts that we have today. But he did the best that he could. When he left out the, the doctrine of the Trinity, they said, uh, in 1 John 5 and 7, they banned his writings. By the time Erasmus died, the Catholic Church had absolutely denounced him as a heretic and that his books should be all destroyed. The devil at work. That man tried to restore the Bible the best he could at his time. I showed this text to you. And I'll do it again on this one so you can see it, those out that are out there. That's Theodore Bezos' text of Erasmus' text printed in 1628. This is a lifetime of work. Here is the original leaf from the original 1611 King James Bible. This one was printed in 1611. And that's the book of Jeremiah there. Getting back to Erasmus. Erasmus was 30 years old when he began to study a Greek because he thought it was absolutely imperative that he learned the language and try to get down the best uncorrupted text of the New Testament that he could get down. And he began to do it. Now he's 30 years old. How long did people live? Erasmus lived from 1466 uh, to 1536. He lived a long lifetime for the people that lived then. But most of the people at that period of time only lived 40 to 50 years. Now, at 30 years old, which they considered to be three quarters of his lifetime at least or more, he decided to study Greek. So that should give you an incentive. Now, he, he wanted to study Hebrew, but he said his brain would only hold so much. That's all the room that there is. He was the greatest Greek scholar in his time and the greatest Hebrew scholar, or not Hebrew, but Latin scholar of all time. Now remember that in 641 AD, as Islam was going into, to constant, into Alexandria to burn the library there, a bunch of those monks took off with the Greek manuscripts. And that's 400 and, or 641 A.D. Some of the manuscripts they had were very old. And I told you also that some of the manuscripts had been erased. The original manuscripts were erased. Mm -hmm. You go back up here to the Paulicians, right over here, 
these people, there was a guy by the name of Constantine there, all right, that had a whole copy of all the writings of Paul and the New Testament, and he gave the Paulicians a copy of that, and they called them Paulicians because they had, they had all the writings of Paul, and these Paulicians went where, Brother Ray? Where did these Paulicians go? To the valleys of the Piedmont. And then I told you in 1600, uh, Samuel Morton wrote a history of the people that went in there, and I didn't tell you a lot about that the last time. I'm going to now. The Paulicians had a whole Bible. Now, this is in 426 A.D. Now, the Bible was being banned. Remember when the Latin Vulgate was finished and canonized, and it was the Word of God inspired in 405 A.D.? So now this is 426 A.D. when the Paulicians come on the scene. They're over there in Armenia or Turkey or whatever you want. There's where the seven churches of Asia were, by the way. They're over there, and they're spreading out, and they're making converts, and they got the whole Bible. A lot of the Christians, the Bible is being forbidden now. You have to realize the Bible is forbidden in the Greek language. They're making copies of it. And then, in 570 A.D., guess who's born? Muhammad. This is 100 years later. 570 A.D., Muhammad's born. By 632, they say he died, but actually there's Christian uh, histories of him going into Jerusalem in 500 and, or 634 A.D. Or somebody by that name, he came in there killing everybody. Burning the scriptures. Burning every Bible he could find because it, it was corrupted. That's what he said. Satan using him. Satan using the Catholic Church. Erasmus, as much great wealth of information that he gained by the time of his death, and he was still a Catholic priest and a member of the Catholic Church, Brother Ray, they denounced him because he said the Latin Vulgate was not good. That his Greek New Testament and his Latin translation, which you have right there, and which you have the Gospel of Matthew there, 10 and 11 chapter, that was more founded on a much sounder basis than what Jerome had. Saint Jerome. And instead of naming him Saint Erasmus, they denounced him. They denounced him. Now, by 632 A.D., we have the Muslims chasing down and trying to kill all the Christians. So they drove them out of Asia Minor, and guess where they went? To the valleys of Piedmont into Europe. They went into Russia. They went into Germany. They went into all of those northern European states. They became the Mennonites and the Amish that you see, unusual people unusual people with unusual faith these people in the late 500's what happened in the valleys of the Piedmont those people had been chased out a thousand years before out of Armenia and they went into Europe and they hid out up there and the people were different they, they dressed differently they, they talked differently they lived differently you have to realize that the Catholics in the world at that time were ungodly rascals. Mm -hmm. They look at the evolution of Catholicism, what, what the Catholic Church, baptismal regeneration, infant baptism, we have the church and the state become one. We have infant baptism established by all. Mariolatry, the, the worship of Mary began in the 5th century. We have Leo II declared as Pope. But in all reality, in 325, Constantine the Great was declared the Pope. Because everything that he said was ex cathedral, which was continuous revelation, and everything he did and everything he said was as holy as the Word of God. Now, I thank God that he had 50 Greek manuscripts made. And remember, 325 is before 405 A.D. when the Catholic Church banned the Bible in any other language but the Latin 
because they wanted to take the Latin, they wanted to take the Bible out of the people's hands because what were they doing? They were changing the practices of Christianity. It had become Christian dumb. Indulgences, purgatory, saint and image worship, mariolatry, transubstantiation, celibacy, confession. There is no mediator between man and God except Christ Jesus. Is that true? Yes, Brother Ray. This Constantine we're talking about, did he end up in Constantinople later? Who? Constantine. Did he end up in Constantinople later? That was named after him, Constantinople. Oh, then, yeah, okay. And then they changed it right. later on after the after the Muslim world changed it. Mm -hmm. it they changed the name again. Okay. But <clears throat> the, the Baptists, the Paulicians, these people had to go into Europe, and they took those Bibles with them. They took them in Greek. Erasmus wanted to get his hands on some of the oldest manuscripts. His manuscripts were not over 1,000. He had one 600 A.D. manuscript, which was, but you know, they didn't have any way to date the manuscripts like we do today. They didn't have any way. To, he had one ancient manuscript, but he, he didn't do anything with that. He just kind of ignored it. What's the number of the Antichrist? What? <laughs> what is a what? What is the number of the Antichrist? Six six six. Do you know that the oldest Greek manuscript of the Book of Revelation says six one six? And that's the one that Tischendorf translated that Book of Revelation, the one he that Palmaquist that he translated. And it's been found in two old ones of 616. Now that is a difference, isn't it? But I want to ask you something. The 616 or 666, does that make a difference between heaven and hell? No. Who Jesus Christ is, does that make a difference between heaven and hell? Yeah. What you believe about Jesus Christ, does it make a difference between heaven and hell? Yes, but not 616 and 666. It's the number of the Antichrist. Like it might be his zip code or his uh, area code. Or his address. Those poor people, those Christians went into Europe. And they were destroyed because they believed and practiced the word of God. Those Catholics that went into the valleys of the Piedmont that destroyed those people. They burned them alive in caves. And they ate the women's breasts, roasted them and ate them. They raped them and pillaged them. They stole everything they had of any value and burned all the scriptures. If that's not inspired of Satan, do you tell me what it is. Mm. Satan using religions Satan used Catholicism and Satan used Islam to try to destroy the word of God. They tried. Tried. It's not destroyed, is it? It's still here today. Now, in 641 AD in Europe we had a revival, a renaissance of the Greek language for a short time. They had some very old manuscripts. The manuscripts they had go back into the, at least the third century. When Tischendorf went to Mount Sinai, he discovered a very old manuscript. And he went back there again and got some more of them. That, it, that ended up in Russia. And England bought it later on. Sinaiticus. It went all over the place. But it's probably one of the sister manuscripts copied in 325 AD. And it was the whole Bible. The whole Bible. The Codex Vaticanus, even though the, the Catholic Church did not believe in the Bible any longer, they worshipped that as a relic in the Vatican. 325 AD. 
There are many manuscripts much older than that now today. It's a miracle that the Word of God is here. It's a miracle. A miracle of God. Now let's go back to page 392 and lectures from systematic theology. The Word of God, when we say the Word of God, we mean the Bible. Consisting of the canon of scriptures that we have. Where are we going? On page 392. Now, I'm not going to quote this exactly like it's from the book, okay? So, we're there, we're down in the middle of the page. But I'm going to, to kind of paraphrase this as we go. What does the Word of God do? What does the Word of God do? In 2 Timothy 3.16 it says it's profitable for teaching. Profitable for teaching. Is the Word of God profitable for teaching? Yes, sir. Do we believe in continual revelation? No. There is no more revelation after this. 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter and the 12th chapter, says that, that we see in the Word of God clearly, or we are so clearly, but right then they were looking into a glass darkly that was sooted over, smoked over. But when the Word of God comes, that perfect thing came. We can look at ourselves just exactly like we are. God describes man as he is. It's probable for, for teaching. This is what we call doctrine. A lot of churches today say that they don't teach doctrine, that they're non-denominational. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You've got to lean one way or the other. You're either a Calvinist or you're Armenian, and what does that mean? What's a Calvinist? What does a Calvinist believe? Sharon? Well, grace, grace, grace. They salvation by grace. What does Armenian believe? Works, works, works. Catholicism turned into Armenian theology. And it got worse and worse and worse as it went on. Look at what Mariolatry, the worship of Mary, indulgences. You could buy your way into heaven. That's like uh, 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 get out of jail free, you know, you know, monopoly. It's not true. It's not true. And what did they think? What, how did they get this idea of indulgences? We're going away from the Word of God, aren't we? This way off from the Word of God. What is an indulgence? What is this? I knew it was money you paid. It's Sharon. Fundraising for cathedrals. Fundraising for cathedrals, yes. And for war. 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 Catholic Church and Islam warred for a thousand years. Warred. Not one bit of it, not the Crusades, none of it was godly. War comes right straight from hell in the name of religion, Satan's inspirations. If it wasn't for the Catholic Church, Muhammad wouldn't know how to conquer by the sword. His religion didn't work by theology. It worked by brute force. Catholicism, their religion evolved. They just went with the time. They get a pagan here and a pagan there. Well, this is adopt some of your ways so it won't be uncomfortable for you. That's when they started making churches what? Friendly? User friendly? Sure. Indulgences. How did, what, what do you mean indulgences? The Apostle Paul was such a good guy that he did so many good works that he, didn't, he had some left over so they could go on to you. It would be efficacious to you. It is a, uh, what we call, a vehicle of grace. Mm -hmm. So the Catholic Church is going to control everything, so all the extra good merits that Paul had, and Thomas had, and Peter had, and James, and Mary, don't forget Mary now. Mary has really become a god. Mm -hmm. All of these extra merits, a drop of Jesus' blood. That blood was miraculous. I want you to understand something right now. Everything that Jesus did on this earth was to prove that he was Messiah King and to prove that he was God. 
he, has, he handed over his administration of his kingdom to his ecclesia, his church. What saves you? What saves you? Is it the blood of Jesus or was it the life of Jesus? Think. The blood of Jesus became a object of worship. But what saves you from hell? It is the life, the death, and the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. His blood was important. But the blood is what saves you. It is his life, his death, burial, and resurrection that saves you. His blood is important, but that's not saved. But they would get a drop of his blood, so-called. One of his diapers. Pieces of a diaper. Pieces of the cross. The cross did not save you. That wooden cross does not save you. A piece from that cross will not save you. It is the life, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that saves you. Okay? That's what saves you. But if people could get you, if, if, if a religion could carry you away from God's word, away from that real efficacious, dynamic efficacious ability to give you eternal life, it will. Indulgences. We have all these left over. All the popes, you know, the popes. The popes were really good, too. And so they were so good. Why, Jerome, you know, I mean, he dedicated his life to, to translating the Latin Vulgate by inspiration. Don't forget it. Ex Cathedral. Brethren, the Old and the New Testament are ex Cathedral, and that's all you get. <laughs> you get no more. That is it. By the work of the Holy Spirit, God uses his word to change lives, to save souls. It's the word of God. Purgatory. People will go to a temporary hell. Now, Hades is a temporary hell, isn't it? But it's not purgatory. You're not in purgatory in the Catholic Church's invention of purgatory. In that purgatory, it's people that go there that are Catholics, but they weren't really good enough to go to heaven. Muhammad been in one of those two. Muhammad invented another one. The only way if you're Islamic, the only way that you can get to heaven is to die in jihad, giving your life for Muhammad. Indulgences. Purgatory. All inventions of men's minds. You're not going to find any of them in the Word of God. None of it. So what do you do? You get rid of the Word of God. So you can teach these things. You're forbid the Bible. In 405 A.D., the Bible was forbidden in any language except Latin. And guess who only knows Latin? Some of the priests didn't even know Latin. They just knew how to do the formulas. The doctors and the lawyers and the rulers knew Latin. From 325 B.C. to 325 or more A.D., almost 400 A.D., the, the Greek, Koine Greek, was the language of the world. And the Bible was written in that language because it's the most perfect language that's ever been devised by mankind. And God chose it and inspired those people to use that language so that we could have a word of God in the most perfect language that's ever been used by man. Saint and image worship. You can pray to a saint. You can make a statue to him, but, but the God of heaven says don't make an image of anything under the earth, above the earth, or in the heaven, or anything else, nor anybody else, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Why, the Muslims will get really excited if you draw a cartoon of Muhammad, but they'll put him there, and they will put a veil on him. Now, you know what the name for, uh, for Allah is? The many-veiled Allah. Guess what? Muhammad's veil. Every attribute of Jesus Muhammad claims, including the judge of all men. Here is Allah and here is Muhammad sitting on the throne, and we see these Muslims walking across this fiery hell bridge. They have to suffer. And then Muhammad judges them.
because all are gave the ability to judge most perfectly by to Muhammad. Who's the judge of all mankind? Jesus, Jesus not Muhammad. No, nor any saint. And then we have transubstantiation, which changes the wafer, the cracker, into the body of Jesus Christ and the cup with the wine in it into the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ does not save you. It is the life, death, burial, and resurrection that saves you. It's not a cracker, and it's not that cup. That cup and that cracker represent Jesus, don't they? But there is no efficacious. It is not a vehicle of grace. It is not. A, how many sacraments are there in the Catholic Church? Seven. All of them are vehicles of grace, even marriage. Hmm. Transubstantiation. Celibacy. That terrible, terrible, terrible invention that Catholicism, and of course this is ex cathedral, remember, the Pope invented this, that all the priests will be celibate. Because Peter was celibate. But Peter had a wife. And Paul said he could have had a wife just like Peter. So to see, what call, what did that cause in the world? All the child molesting and all the homosexuality. Why the Vatican is full of homosexuals. Full of it. Full of it. Because of that hellish doctrine that came right out of hell. We have uh, confession. We have the Bible convicted. We have the Inquisition. What was the Inquisition? That was trial by torture. And many Baptists died in that Inquisition. And even in America, many Baptists were burned and killed as witches. We see all of this. What does the Word of God do? What does it do? Since they try to replace it with all of these forms of worship and everything, then the Bible was was absolutely forbidden. A religion forbidding the Bible. And by the way, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Muslim, you can't pray to God, Allah. You have to recite the Quran, and you have to recite it in Arabic because God doesn't know any other language. Talking about minimizing God. <clears throat> the Bible. The Word of God is a critique of our activities in our heart, in our minds. It critiques us. It comes from the word, Greek word kritikos. The Bible is a hammer, according to Jeremiah 29. What does a hammer do? Beat things in shape. But I'll tell you something else. The Bible is an anvil. You can wear out a lot of hammers on a handle, but the anvil will still be there. The Bible is a hammer. The Bible is an anvil. The Bible will break a hard heart, won't it? It will thrash the thoughts of the un, the Adamic, what we call the kakos nature in Greek, that Adamic nature. The Word of God will critique you in your thoughts and in your heart. The Bible is a mirror. Now let's go back. Where in the world is that? There it is, the tabernacle over here. The labor over here. What was the labor made out of, Brother Ray? Glass mirrors. It was made glass. out of looking glasses, out of brass mirrors. Now go back in time. The, Jew, the Jews are in uh, Egypt, and they're in there, and all the women, every woman wants to see how she looks. Did you do that this morning, every one of you women? Did any woman here, woman here not do that? Did you not look in a mirror this morning when you, when you combed your hair and made you look, what, put cosmetics on or whatever you do to get yourself in order? You look in a mirror. If you didn't do anything except put earrings on and fix your hair, you looked in a mirror. Women always have to have looking glasses. They just have to have them. Way back yonder, now, the best-looking glasses were actually gold and silver. Silver was the best because it's, it's silver. And it gives you an image in color, even, of what you look like. 
And most old mirrors, I don't know whether you got an old mirror in this house. Do you have an old mirror in this house, Carol? Old mirrors were glass with silver on the back of it. Silver. Pure silver. And it was sealed. And that made the most perfect mirrors. And silver was the, was the mirrors of the rich. But the average person had a brass mirror. A brass mirror. How about Narcissus? How about the history of Narcissus? You know who Narcissus was? We got our word narcissistic out of that. Narcissus was a Greek legend that this guy was so handsome that he was just he was he was just handsome. But one day he went down to the river, and the river was real quiet in this one place, and it reflected his perfect image. And he stood there and looked at himself and that image and worshipped himself until he starved to death. Mirrors. Have you ever seen a person in your life that was so in love with themselves that they just looked and they sat in front of the mirror day after day, morning after morning, and had to have every hair in place before they would go out and face the world? That's what you call narcissistic. We have a lot of that on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Word of God is like a mirror. We see ourselves as we really are. That labor was created out of mirrors that reflected the image of these people. When you come in, when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you come by the way of the Word of God. Why, one of the great kings of Israel, the Bible had been forbidden and, and, and lost, for, and he got up and had the Bible read, and all the people started bawling and squalling and repenting. The Bible causes you to see yourself as you are. You see yourself as you are, and you mourn. I preached a sermon since I was here the last time about the mourner's bench the mourner's bench and how the churches have taken the mourner's bench out of the churches. Before you can have true life, you have to mourn for what, you, and the Word of God does this. The Word of God calls you to mourn over what you have done wrong. It does or does not. The mourner's bench. The Word of God convicts you. It stabs you down in your heart. In Acts 2.38, when, when Paul, or not Peter, when Peter was talking to those people, uh, that great assembly of people on the day of Pentecost, and that wasn't the birthday of the church, by the way. The church was already there. The, the Lord told his church to meet there. The church already had baths in it and already had the Lord's Supper. It already had a tr real good treasure. <laughs> we got a better one. <laughs> had a clerk of all these things. You know who the clerk was? Probably Matthew. He wrote down everything. You know, he sat over there by the sea shores of Galilee, and every boat that came across that sea from Syria and into his way all had to have a tax paid on it, and he wrote down who it was and everything. He wrote it down and said, I need a church clerk. Come here, Matthew. <laughs> Follow me. And he wrote the book of Matthew, didn't he? He did. He wrote the book of Matthew. Good clerk. <clears throat> well, the Bible is a means of a vehicle of grace. The Bible is a vehicle of grace. Baptism isn't. The Lord's Supper isn't. Marriage isn't. Saint and image prayers and worship isn't. The Lord Jesus Christ using his Bible is a vehicle of grace. It brings you to know of what the grace of God is. It convicts your heart. It's a mirror. It's like that laver where the priests were dipped one time and then every time they went in there to that holy place they had to wash their hands and feet didn't they before they went in there. And they had to go in there barefooted didn't they? Right. Why? Well, you take them there they were walking on dirt. They were walking in dirt because they were dirt. We're all dirt. Barefooted, we come before God.
naked we come before God. Mm -hmm. And the Word of God teaches this. The Word of God is like a good shower. I've been taking a shower up there in really clean water in Fish Lake Valley, but I don't get, I've only got a five gallon water heater up there. So I don't get to take a shower very long, but it is clean water. And when you wash your clothes up there, they come out brilliant white because there's no dirt in that water. Now I came down here last night to Old River out there and I took a bath for about a half hour because I was hurting all over. I just stood in that thing with it vibrating on my back and my head and everything, my neck. And I stood in that dirty water for 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you wash your clothes and they're going to come out gray and it's got a filter in it too but it still doesn't get all that dirt the word of God is the most perfect clean water there is it's like water it's like waters of life God showing you who Jesus was who Jesus was it's bread for the soul it's milk for baby. It's strong meat for the grown. It's like honey. It's like gold. It's a lamp to our feet. It is a means of salvation. It makes us clear when the word of God is preached, Christ crucified, how to get to God. It gives us that. It gives us the road map to God. It is a road. It is a pathway to our feet. It is a means of salvation. Paul said to Timothy, and from a babe you have, been, you have known the sacred writings which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The word of God will not lead you any place else except to Christ, number one, and to the church, number two. To Christ and to the church. Our souls are corrupted. Peter says that having been begotten again, not of corruptible seed as our fathers has given to us, but of incorruptible seed through the word of God which lives and abides in us. The law of Jehovah, the word of God is perfect, restoring the soul, Psalm 19 and verse 7. The restoring of the soul, the restoring of life, giving you eternal life. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. What do you mean being born again? He said, don't you know, are you a master teacher of the word? And you don't know what being born again is? I must tell you. If I can't tell you physical things, how can I tell you spiritual things? They they had becoming they had become absolutely addicted to the Mishnah and the Talmud, the interpretation of the law instead of the law itself. The Word of God is a means of sanctification. It's a mirror, it's a labor, it's a lamp, it's a sword. As in James and and 125 and 2 Corinthians 3.18. It is a water of purification, purification in John 15.3, Ephesians 5 and 26, Psalm 119, verse 11. It is the lamp to guide the wandering feet in the path of righteousness. It is a sword to overcome the enemy. It sanctifies us by the word of truth, and thy word is truth. There is an absolutely very important way that you must study the Word of God. First of all, you must realize it's God's Word. It is God's Word. It is God's message to you. Now, if there is a God in heaven, isn't it reasonable that he would give us a message? If he wants us to come to him, wouldn't it be reasonable that he would give you a direction? What happened to all those people before Charles Taze Russell and before Judge Rutherford? And what happened to all the people in the world before Muhammad? What happened to all those people before Jesus? They were looking to Jesus. What happened to all those people after Jesus? We're looking back to him. And the Word of God tells us how to do that. What song do you have, Brother Vincent? 
what the Word of God does. The Word of God can change your life. The Word of God can lead you to salvation. It is a vehicle of the grace of God that leads you unto salvation by the work of the Holy Spirit. Father, we send this message out, your word, that will touch lives, that will lead them to salvation, the knowledge of you, and that will give them comfort and give them confidence that if you could bring your word to all of the powers of hell, and it's still in existence in the world today, that you can save their lives and keep them. Forgive me where I fail you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh, what are we going to do then? Oh.